This video is all about explaining the different appliances and the way that you can deploy QReader. This is an informal training. If you are interested in quality free training, you may want to visit the IBM Security Learning Academy and I'm providing a link to it in the video description. So let me start by uh, saying that the appliances are denoted with uh, four characters. The first two denote the function of the appliance. It's a console, it's an all-in-one, etc. We'll go into more detail later. And the last two has to do with the capacity of the of the machine, the type of technology, whether it has uh, you know SSD drives, whether it's a fast processor or a modern machine or not. So for example, when I talk about a 3129, the first two digits denote that this is a console, and more on this later, while the last two digits denote that the type of machine that it is. In the same way, a 3148 is an all-in-one or a console, and the 48 denotes that that's a um, uh, machine, particularly with SSD drives. So, you can deploy QReader in the simplest way with a 31 XX device, again 29 or 48 on, uh, on the modern, and it is what is called an all-in-one, okay? What does it mean? That this device does the following function, of course works as the console, take care of collecting events, take care of parsing those events and flows, takes care of the correlation of all those with the, the great curator rules, uh, and perform the searches when you are looking for a particular type of traffic or piece of information. And of course you connect to it uh, both uh, logs and flows. Again, this is just the part one of the video. Uh, in subsequent, I'm going to talk about uh, geographic distribution, cloud, hybrid mode, etc. But what happens if you uh, have more capacity, more, uh, and the capacity in Curator are measured in events per second and flows per minute? Of course, one for flows and one for logs. So flows per minute and events per second. Uh, well, let's say that you exceed the capacity of a particular box of that console. Well, it's uh, very easy. What you can do is you can get an appliance. This appliance is the 16XX. Again, 16 denotes the function of what is called an event processor. Okay? So, and that event processor is actually make room for a couple of more things in here. Uh, you connect it in here and what you do is that you take all these functions and you move them away from the 31XX and leave it only working as a console and you move those things into the 16XX. Okay? Now, you can also do the similar thing with flows. Let's say that you exceed the number of flows that you are collecting, then you can deploy a 17XX, which is a flow processor. Or you can even have a combined event processor plus flow processor, which is an 18XX device. Okay? Now, how do you connect flows. Well, the, the thing is that there are different type of flows, as we, you probably know. First one, one is end flows. Network flows, J flows, uh, IP fix, uh, you know, stuff that is not the full content of the traffic, but the layer 4 information about it. What does layer 4 give me? What type of protocol is being used? Is it HTTP? Is it FTP? The IP, source and destination, the, the port, source and destination, number of bytes, uh, number of packets. I mean, uh, that is actually very useful information when you are performing uh, these investigations. 
But let me actually finish on the flows and then I'll go back to the to the to the events. What happens if what you want to uh, monitor is the actual full traffic, the payload included? Well, that doesn't come on the net on, on end flows, and particularly net flows is typically what you get from your router. Your router can be enabled to send this information as net flows into curator. But let's say that you want to get the full traffic. So you have a span port or Gigamon, one of those uh, devices that give you the full traffic. Uh, you don't connect those directly to your flow processor. You connect those into what is called a queue flow processor. And that, the, there are two types, the 12XX, which is copper, or the 13XX, which is fiber. And that is the one that you connect actually to your flow processor. What does the Q flow gives you that NetFlows does not? Well, it gives you the first 64 bytes of the payload entirely. So you get that stuff in there and, and you can make uh, rules and, and, and logic that fires on the content of what is on those 64 bytes, which is very meaningful because most of the good thing happened at the beginning of the actual uh, payload so, so you get this the first 64 bytes and and that that's actually can be can be modified can be made uh, bigger what does that gives you in in, in in practical terms well it tells you what type of for example what type of application that is this is a peer-to-peer -peer. is this facebook yeah. and you can inspect you know Anything that is on the payload, you can actually see. Oh, am I sending uh, social security numbers? Well, that's not going to come on the net flows. That comes at if you keep in investigating the, the payload. But again, just the first 64 bytes of it. Curita can do more things. Let's say that um, I'm, I'm interested in inspecting the full payload. Okay. And I want to get things that you do not get from the actual traffic like I want you to compute the hashes of the artifacts going on I want you to compute the file size well for that there is another appliance called Q&I and it's a 1920 there's only one version of it so you connect as with Qflow your span port into it and what this baby does is it, it takes about 40 plus fields from the actual payload like uh, you know, user agent, uh, DNS request, DNS respond, uh, email sender, email receiver, subject of the email, again uh, 40 very useful plus computes the hashes and file sizes real time and send those as IP fix flows into your flow processor very capable of investigating things that happen on on the on the payload of the traffic let's go back a little bit to the event processor and i want to mention two things one is and, and I'll, in a separate video we'll talk more about you know geographic distribution and and what if i data needs to stay in a particular location and things like that but for now let's say that I have a remote location with low bandwidth and or intermittent access to the internet the, the classical example of these are ships uh, cruise ships and you know they, they don't they don't have full connection all the time to the internet and sometimes when they do they prefer to give that bandwidth to the to the passengers and at night I want to send all those logs etc well for that there is a specific appliance the 15xx called the event collector and this guy does the parsing and does a store and forward of those messages if there is bandwidth it's going to send it at you know whatever bandwidth is actually given to it so say this is uh, the internet and then it's going to be sending those into your event processor. 
There's a little bit more to talk about it to fill up this page and conclude this part one video, which is I'm interested in, in, in getting everybody is fast searches. Well, when you perform a search, the search in an environment that is distributed like this, uh, so we move from the all-in-one to this distributed environment, uh, the searches are going to be executed. You, you invoke them from the console, but they're going to be executed at your event processor or your flow processor, right? Which means that the event processor has to, you know, share the CPU, the disk, uh, I.O. and the RAM uh, for event processing as well as the search or the searches that all the SOC operator wants to do. And of course, the event processor is going to give priority to those event processing or flow processing things rather than your searches. So that may impact your searches. Well, if you want to have fast searches or faster searches, there is a very Actually, this device, uh, the, 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 what I'm talking in here, the data node, does not even require licensing for it. So it's a very inexpensive uh, device that allows you to increase your storage because the, you know, the data is going to be stored here, not on the event processor or both. You can actually you know, have uh, increased your capacity. But the most important thing is that you are adding CPU, this, and RAM to perform those searches. So the, the events are collected uh, and or processed by the event processor and I, and I stored at the data node. And when the search is performed, the job is divided and this thing can dramatically speed your searches. Is that you have in, you're having multiple SOC operator performing you know, uh, lots of uh, searches over long periods of time. Uh, so that's the way you speed that up. One more box before we finish uh, this part one of the video. Let's say that you are running applications on Curator like UBA. UBA is actually pretty, it's, if, particularly if you do machine learning, it's going to require a lot of memory, uh, a lot of resources for it. But all the devices that we have spoke up, up to now are called managed host. Okay. They are controlled from the console, and that, that's the terminology for all these appliances on a distributed em environment. There's one that is not a managed host, and that is called an app node. Basically, any machine that has either Red Hat or CentOS can be defined as an app node. And what this will do is allows you to have your application run with as much memory as there is on that particular box any 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 box that you that you can define and that is called an app node and that offloads them the it doesn't it doesn't compete on the console for memory disk and and, and, and an io and you connect that one of course to the console and that allows you to uh, have uh, a high performance UBA again without impacting the rest of your operation particularly machine learning again is very heavy in terms of tracking what every user is actually doing so it uses a lot of memory you don't want to compete with the with the console because the actual console is going to win in fact uh, when when the applications run inside the console they are restricted in many ways when you run in an app though those restrictions uh, go away and again, this is not a managed host. Okay, so that concludes the first part, the basics of the curator appliances. In the next videos, I'm going to be talking about what you do with you have geographic distribution. Uh, what are you going to do with the cloud? Uh, I'm, I'm, what, what things are doing? What am I doing with VMware? What, what about a hybrid environment? Pros and cons. Uh, 